we found another playable character. In a sea of non-playable characters, it is so hard these days to find someone who thinks for themselves, who is a free thinker, who will question assumptions, question norms, and, and use their, their God-given higher faculties, will use their intuition. Daniel Prince is one of those people, and I have a special place in my heart for him. He helped me really get into the Bitcoin content space uh, almost a year ago. Uh, had me on his podcast, which he, we talk about here, uh, the books he's written. Please go check those out. And dropped many other names of books and people he studied from over the years to become really one of the foremost people, especially in the Bitcoin space, of, of kids education, kids rearing, kids formation, and the, the disservice formal education has done to all of us over the last hundred years. He's one of the smartest speakers and, and people in this space and one of the people I respect the most. And what he is doing, put his money where his mouth is, money where his mouth is and living a certain way and, and raising a family that can, uh, you know, and having young kids that can speak with anyone, can stand on stage and speak at conferences. This is the kind of family he is growing because of the pieces and because of the foundation he is building, being outside of central money, being outside of central schooling, being outside of central health and central food. He is truly blazing a path. I hope you enjoy this episode with Daniel. Like I said, he's one of the, the best people, down to earth, smartest people there is, and you're going to learn a lot. Get a, a pen and a paper, you're gonna need it. I give to you Daniel Prince. Enjoy. Daniel Prince, thank you, sir, for coming on. I, I appreciate you so much coming on, and uh, I, you're one of the first in the uh, in the, just the Bitcoin space. I remember getting into Bitcoin Twitter a year ago, and uh, a little less than a year ago, and then you had me on your podcast. So uh, I just I really appreciate you and what you do for the space, and uh, thank you for coming on today, sir. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Yes. Yeah. So the, 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 one of the things I love about you is the, is the, uh, you know, the, the kids, right. It's for the kids. It's a big thing in the Bitcoin space. And uh, you know, I want to, you know, there's a lot in the Bitcoin space talking about macro and a lot of different stuff, you know, but I think what's so important in my opinion is the kids, right. The future and what's actually happening. And I know it does touch a lot of Bitcoiners uh, and, and tug on the heartstrings and what we're really in this for. So um I would love to kind of walk through just that journey of how you got to Bitcoin and you sharing your story, but also kind of what you're working on now and kind of your passion with, with the kids and what you're doing, you know, homeschooling with your children. I love, by the way, when you, you know, you come on, someone comes on the podcast, you have the girls, one of the girls ask a question to them. I love that. Um, so let's dive into it, kind of the story and, and kind of where that's, uh, where that journey emanated from. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, where to start grew up in the UK. Um, just normal kind of go to the local comprehensive school. Um, left uh, after doing A-levels at the age of 19. I didn't go to university. I went into the city. We were very close to London, just an hour's commute into London. And went into the city, found a job in the financial markets, in the foreign exchange markets. And by the age of 22, had the opportunity to move out to Singapore. So we moved out to Singapore, my then girlfriend and I, and uh, that's where the bulk of my career was spent. We spent the next 15 years in Singapore. We had all four kids there. Wow. Uh, I got out of the business, um, quit because I could tell it was not heading in the right direction. Nothing really felt right anymore. Uh, I still hadn't discovered Bitcoin. I'd ignored it and poo-pooed it many times. But in 2014, finally... Um, we just quit and uh, we left the country that we'd called home for 15 years and had all our kids there and we started traveling. So we bounced around the world for two and a half years via the sharing economy. We were home swapping and house sitting. Uh, I ended up writing a book about that. That's called Choose Life. Um, and then we were house sitting in France for an extended period, like two or three months. And we decided that if we could gift the children one thing in life, it would be the ability to speak another language. So we figured we might as well stick around in France for a little bit and immerse them as much as we could. Uh, so we did put them in the school where they did learn the language. My oldest one wanted to stay in the school system. My uh, other three wanted out. So we took them out and they now use a self-directed education platform called Kubrio. It's K-U-B-R-I-O.com. And um, that's kind of where... We, we got stuck, really. We, we've been here. It's um, We started in 2016, so now we are 2023. So we've been here a fair amount of time. And 
it was really in 2015 that I started. Hey, really quick, I want to annoy the hell out of you with a quick little break to just remind you that we have to share the signal within the noise because the algorithm hate truth. The algorithm hates truth. So we have to do all that we can to spread the signal. The faster we do that, the quicker change comes to the world. We need to be the change we seek to be. What are we doing? What am I doing? What are you doing to build a future? Also, if you want a written version of a lot of what we do here, please go to the description and find the link to our, our blog, our Substack, as well as you will see many links to the either the work or the companies the places you can find all the playable characters here that we talk to and how you can connect with them. So now back to the show. Thank you. Deeply looking into Bitcoin and trying to like hoover up all of the knowledge that I could. Um, and that never stopped. And I, I couldn't switch that off. So fast forward to 2020, when I was still trying to learn as much as I could after five years. Uh, I decided to start my own podcast, and uh, to my surprise, my daughter Lauren, who was nine at the time, wanted to come on and start asking some questions after I'd completed about 10 podcasts. Uh, that They figured out, well, he's been going on Bitcoin for a long time, and now he's actually talking to people from all over the world, and now he's actually shipping a podcast, and apparently that's getting three, 500, 1,000 episodes, uh, downloads per episode. So maybe there is something here. So she showed interest to come in and speak to the people and she's been helping me. She asks the first question on the, on the show, uh, which is cool because then you get her exposed to this incredible network and to people answering her questions as they would to a child, which uh, the listeners enjoy listening to. So we were yes. just in Prague um, where we were at the conference and I took three of the kids to Miami as well. Yeah. Uh, so my oldest daughter and Lauren were working for Safer Dean in Miami. They were on his booth the full three yeah, days. So I'm at the booth. Books yeah. with him. Yeah. Yeah. And then we came back to France, and then we went across to Prague. Lauren and her brother Samuel. We went a lot uh, across to Prague. Samuel was running a little gaming area with his little friend Sam. And uh, um, Lauren uh, actually hosted a panel on one of the side stages. Uh, with Giacomo Zucco and, and Joe Hall, Joe Nakamoto on Twitter. And it was so well received. And I'm really looking forward to when the, that, that gets dropped on YouTube. And I hope uh, people tune in and watch it. And there was another girl there, Sam, the, the BTC kid, Sam Duvall. And she gave a keynote uh, straight after Sailor on the main stage. She went up and delivered a keynote. So what's happening is people are sitting up and taking notice that there are kids at these Bitcoin conferences and that has a snowball effect because all the married men that are there alone by themselves geeking out, trying to find <laughs> their uh, internet friends who they've never actually met in real life, uh, see so the kids and see the wives and they're like, whoa, hang on. So I can bring my wife and kids. And you know, when that happens, it's such a powerful orange pilling effect because it's so real and you can feel the optimism and the hope, and you can feel uh, the confidence in people and the conviction. And uh, I, I just hope more and more plebs who are listening are able to expose their their wife and their children or their husband and their children uh, in such a way and get along to a meetup or, or get along to a conference, no matter how big or small, because uh, that's really where uh, minds start unlocking. And uh, opportunity. Uh, since Caitlin met uh, Krista at the Bitcoin Policy Institute in the UK, Krista has been in, in touch and she wants Caitlin to host a monthly podcast for the Bitcoin Policy Institute UK. So amazing. That's awesome. Amazing. What, what an experience. Uh, and um, another, another Bitcoiner has been in touch that knows she's going on a gap here and says, well, Get across to the US. We've got a room for you. We've got a job for you. You can intern with us and you can get the experience that you need to set you up for your next step. It's incredible. And this that's what this um, whole community is about. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's been, you can't really put it into words, to be honest. You, you, it's even more evident when you get home from these conferences and you have the come down when you get back to the drudgery of normal life. So true. 
just dealing with the administrative BS that gets lobbed at you left, right, and center. Uh, you, you know, tuning it, tuning that out is uh, is so easy when you're at one of these conferences, but when you come back, it's just all encompassing and all over you. And you're like, ugh. So there's definitely something special about meeting Bitcoiners. And if we can bring along the kids along the way and they can get swept up in that hope and optimism and conviction and confidence, that's there, there are four parts of life that are generally missing in the, in young people's lives because they're just shackled to the freaking desk in a classroom for five days a week, eight hours a day. You know, so what do they, yes. they don't feel hope and optimism, and uh, optimism, confidence and conviction. They feel the complete opposite. They feel anger, depression, anxiety, confusion. Uh, and uh, if, yeah, I'm, I'm here to blaze a trail for anybody following me uh, that either down the Bitcoin rabbit hole or down the uh, alternative education or homeschool, unschool, world school rabbit hole, uh, call it what you will. What what the uh and yeah and beautifully said by the way and I'm I'm gonna try to bring my whole family uh my wife and four kids to Nashville next year, uh to Bitcoin mm-hmm. Miami so that uh, drive down and it, it, you just you have to be there to experience it to see what's truly going on and you said that so well um w- speaking of again in the live what's after my own heart as well is the kids education stuff I think I was maybe telling you before I can't remember but uh, working on a few you know kids books you know some simple stuff having four young kids under six um and just seeing the the lack of content that's out there and and you know this very well but just the lack of k- children's education and content and whether it's liberty and freedom or sound money there's just there's just very little um so it's just kind of i know the tuttle twins have become very big and yep. his story is very similar of like yeah there was just nothing out there so i just started writing my own stuff and i know that's kind of you know that's what you've been doing and like a lot of us just like hey you know what we got to take this in into our own hands um in saying that what you know what was the mention again the, the what the platform you use for homeschooling and, and mention mm. uh and talk a little bit about how that kind of came about and just kind of that story of like okay hey this isn't the the yeah. formal system is just brainwashing kids so i would love for you to dive into that more sure absolutely so how did i fall down that rabbit hole first of all i guess <laughs> is a good place to start because people like to hear it from you know the, the those that have done it before yes. and this is one thing this is one thing i found when we were making a decision to quit my job and uh throw everything sell everything and throw the keys back at the landlord and take the kids out of school the advice i was getting was unsolicited one and from people that had never done the things that i was seeking to do or achieve so people that had never quit their career were telling me i was crazy like the great point uh, okay <laughs> On, on what grounds are you coming from? Um, yeah. Well, the grounds of just sit there for another 20 years and, you know, you might get to be a vice president or this or that, you know, basically speaking from from their own bias. And those that were saying, oh, you cannot take your kids out of school. What are you doing? You can't take your kids out of the education system. Free education is a human right. Think of the kids in Africa. <laughs> Why would you ever take your children out of school? Oh. This is irresponsible parenting and all of this kind of classic bullshit. And then you realize, okay, have you ever taken your kids out of school? No, you haven't. So where is the practical advice here? There is none. You're just speaking from fear. And you're speaking from your your own programming. So trying to find the signal through the noise is very, very difficult. So we would start doing our own research. And we found uh, family blogs, family world travelers. We found people that were doing the same and were doing it practically or had done it or had written about it or were living it and were writing about it. And you connect with those people. And they're more than happy to, to share experiences. So once we got the confidence to actually write, yes, let's take the kids out of school. Let's go traveling. Um, It all started unraveling for me, the the education system, because all of a sudden it's on you, right? You have the responsibility now to actually full on 100%, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, look after and be responsible, not only for the well-being and health of your child, but also their, their education. And 
what did that look like? What was that going to look like? And all of these dark thoughts and like, uh, yeah, uh, perhaps I am doing damage to my kids and perhaps they will never be able to spell. Perhaps they'll never be able to read. Like, you know, just, the, oh, I've got to send them to school. So you look for not answers. You look for information. You look for people that uh, have written the books and that there are many books out there that, that help you through um, these times. And John Holt, is uh, is one of those writers and he started um you know beating the drum about homeschooling in the US in the 50s and 60s and his work has been carried on by Patrick Ferenga and then you you find a, a TED talk by Sir Ken Robinson that was delivered in 2006 do schools kill creativity and that TED talk blows you away the most downloaded to this day the most downloaded TED talk of all time still so that tells Which you one was that? there's a red flag Sir so Ken Robinson, John Hole, and then Patrick Ferenga. Do schools, do schools, do, yeah. Okay. So do schools kill creative, uh, kill creativity by Sir Ken Robinson? Okay. Um, yeah, and then there's others. There's John Taylor Gatto. His books are incredible. Um, Naomi Fisher is a more recent author, and Peter Gray as well are the notable ones that are the um, when you get talking to people within that community. They're the resources like, okay, you've seen this and you've seen that. You've experienced this, you've experienced that, you've experienced that. Go and read this and that will take you to, you know, the next step. And again, it's, it's finding conviction and getting comfortable with the fact that learning happens naturally. You cannot switch it off unless you put kids into a forced compulsory schooling system then learning does get switched off because they're not allowed to learn. They're forced taught, wrote taught, and taught at. And there's a huge difference between teaching and learning. Learning, as you know, happens naturally on the fly. Learning is when you you look up and five hours has passed and you've been <laughs> studying the same subject. Guilty, like, yeah. Like, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, and that doesn't happen in school. It's not allowed to happen in no. school because every 45 minutes or hour and a half, the bell's going to go and you're going to stand up together and walk to the next lesson together and don't run, don't jump, don't carry your bag on your shoulder. And, you know, all of this kind of rubbish. And when you, when it gets exposed to you and you see that the, the level of programming, indoctrination and uh, nationalistic bent that is going, that is, you've been subjected to in your whole life you can you can start applying different techniques and first of all you've got to want it you, you've got to actually want for your kid to not go through the same bullshit that you went through and it wasn't a lot of bullshit even those people were yeah. sitting there thinking i love to get on to school school was great okay there's probably some some dark memories in there that you've done well. The brain's a very clever thing to completely bury. Um, but it is a, a traumatic uh, setting for, for, to, to, to put very, very young children from the age of two, three, four, or five, however young it is that they go. Um, that is how we started uh, falling down the rabbit hole of self-directed directed education and in 2019, I want to say, uh, a dude on the internet saw something I tweeted about, and he DM'd me. His name was Vlad Stan. Never heard of him. He DM'd me and said, oh, it looks like you're homeschooling your kids too. I know what the tweet was. Uh, it was a book by Dr. Gabor Mate, Hold On To Your Kids, and I underlined a paragraph, and I snapped it, and I sent it. And it resonated with me, and it obviously resonated with him. He was homeschooling his own two sons who were mid-teens. So we got to chatting, but it turns out he's a business builder and he wanted to build uh, an online self-directed education platform. Like, well, the first thing I'm going to do is try and uh, find the people that need the help because if we can find the people, that's, that's our minimal viable audience. And then yeah. I can create the product. So what did we do? We, we did an online Zoom conference in 2019 before online conferences were even a thing, you know, COVID hadn't yep. even happened. Yep. It was pretty novel. Uh, so we got some big names. We interviewed Sir Ken Robinson. We interviewed Pat Ferenga. We interviewed um, Peter Gray. 
and uh, Naomi Fisher. And I got to speak with all of these people who I had idolized because of their work and how much mm-hmm. their work had impacted us and our family. And it was really um, amazing to, to have those conversations. And we had a whole host of people as well, like people who were world schooling at the time, who were sailing around the world on a boat, who were living a van life, who were doing the home swapping thing, who were doing the house, uh, house sitting thing. All of these different ways to travel with your family and layer on education at the same time. And people who were just doing it straight from home and people that were doing it, um, maybe it would be a, a mix. Maybe they were going to some kind of community college and then you know experiential learning. So we had the whole thing. Over 5,000 people, I think, I think about 4,500 people signed up to that, that conference and we were just blown wow. away. So out of that, Vlad started what he called Galileo, um, and that just started with a book club. And the, in the book club were my two oldest daughters and his two sons, and that was the minimum viable product. And they did a book club twice a week, uh, discussing books. It was all online. It was with um, uh, uh, teacher Kelly from a Taiwanese international school, and then it just started growing and it just started taking off because people were attracted to it. And after a few years, it rebranded to Kubrio as I said, K-U-B-R-I-O.com. And two, my two youngest are still on it. They've been on there for three years and they are on there for four days a week. They make their own timetables. They make their own plans. They join the clubs that they want to join. They dis- they're, they're discussing in debate clubs. They're in chess clubs. They're in science clubs, in English clubs, in math clubs. They love it. They absolutely love it. There's not a day that goes by where they haven't got some kind of activity to do uh, but they're not being forced awake. They're not being shaken awake at 6.30 in the morning to get on the big yellow bus. You know, that they're, they're waking up naturally. They're eating healthy food. There's no cereals in the house because we're not time starved. And they're you don't, you they don't like Michelle Obama's meals? Their learning. <laughs> no. <laughs> and they have agency over their learning. They're not told what to do, where to be, and, you know, what to learn. They pick, they pick what they want to learn. And they opt into the clubs that they they find it interesting. And that, I cannot tell you the difference that makes to one family life, but how they're going to, how this is all going to manifest over time. Um, and get, by, by giving them the agency to go deep into things that they want to truly learn about, I truly believe that people that have that opportunity will go on to achieve much greater things in life than sitting in a corner office on the 80th floor with the, you know, the, the VP role that most yep. people think or define as success. And at the very least you're, you're giving them a head start of 20 years. Right. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing. Like I, I hated school growing up, you know, and, and it's, I'm sure a lot of us have the same story where I couldn't stand school. I'm arguing with teachers, arguing with professors. When are we gonna learn about money? How come you're telling us only one side of the story and not the other, you know, on and on and on. And then my real education started once that formal education stopped, you know, when I was early twenties, then I was like, wow, I love learning. I love learning about monetary history and all these things. And I couldn't stop, you know, that's been my life yeah. the last 10, 15 years. So, but I started when I was 22 or 25, where the girls, you know, your kids or whoever isn't doing that world schooling, homeschooling, they're starting from five, you know, three, four, five years old instead of 25. And I think that's the big, one of the, one of the huge differences, you know, aside from family life and all these other things. But um, what I, I want you to take your, uh, not your, your, your best uh, effort. Cause I, I know you, I know you can, but I want you to uh, obliterate the objection that I hear all the time, which is, mm-hmm. you know, it, well, they got to go into school. They got to be in school because it's, they got to be socialized. Well, I mean, <laughs> the social aspect is so good in school. I mean, well, Brandon, you know, it's on and on and on about the kids being around other, you got to re- be around the bullies in school. You got to be around the kids with this and that, you know, like you got to be socialized. You got to be diverse. So I'd love you to uh, opine on that your daniel prince's thoughts on on that <laughs> yes oh socializing your kids are never gonna be able to socialize they'll never get a job they'll never be able to speak to people it's like well okay so is school a social setting so most people think yes because they default to this idea that um uh, a social setting or to be social or to be socializing you need to be in a group of people right so 
most people just think of a group of people um and therefore you can find your friends well it is is that true and if that is true are all those people to be the exact same age as you and if that is true are all those people to be within a five mile radius of where you live and um all will have the same kind of upbringing all have the same kind of background and is that an actual social setting well no it's not it it's forced association is exactly what it is and we've probably got people listening here who might say well i've been friends with uh the same people that i was friends with went through college went through school went through primary school even through kindergarten ever since we were like three years of age well that's more of a camaraderie than an actual true friendship an actual true friendship could be struck up completely in the middle of nowhere just two of you and you're still socializing but what happened you were put into a group of people with 29 other strangers alphabetically algorithmically chosen <laughs> and that's going to be you for the next 15 years so what do you have to do you have to find a comrade right it doesn't get much more communist either right let's think about that <laughs> <laughs> you've, got oh, to, man. you've got to find you have to find a comrade and um that's why and, and i see it in so many kids and i remember it growing up as well that's why you know you, you form this little clique of three four or five of you in the class of 30 and there'll be about five different cliques or three four or five of people and you've got the the you know oh they're the geeks they're the goths they're the jocks they're the the you know the tech nerds they're the um they're the cool guys they're you know it, and it's just disgusting and if you fall out of that click and that click gets made within a week and if you try and move you are just chopped down immediately and drawn back in and there's nothing social about that there's nothing at all social about that and when you do get the chance to actually go and be social let's say at recreation recess or playtime whatever it's called mm -hmm. when you're allowed out of these rooms for 45 minutes to go and exercise in the concrete yard then are you being social then can you go and speak to the 15 year old kids can you go and speak to the eight-year-old kids no man like you cannot go up the rung and talk to people older than you and you, you're certainly never going to give the time of day to kids that are younger than you even though yep. that's been your neighbor for, for the last five years and you know and you've known them since they were a baby don't come up don't ever come up to me at school and ask me a question because i cannot so be true. seen talking to you how is this social this isn't socializing what is happening you're being socialized right it's a thing happening to you in school you're being socialized to work in a certain way to be programmed to do certain things at certain times you've had your time stolen from you you've had your agency stolen from you you're told what to do where to be every minute of the day and you have this almighty high power that comes out of nowhere known as the bell that controls everything and supersedes everyone even the teacher even the teacher gets superseded by this invisible force, right? Anyone see where I'm going with this? Right? Does it sound mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, a, the government structure that we might have set up? But there you go. That, that's, what, what you, that's what you are governed by. It's uh, a completely top-down, totalitarian, authoritarian order. There's no democracy. You have no voice as a student. You are to be completely and utterly um com compliant and do as you're told sit down shut up no talking doesn't sound pretty nothing in there is social so when people come at you with this idea of your kids are never going to be able to talk to people and they're never going to be able to get a job and they're never going to be able to, you know they're all going to be awkward and shit well go to a conference go and see the kids that are coming meet a homeschooled kid and when that homeschool kid comes up to you, stands right in front of you, shakes you firmly by the hand, looks you firmly, squarely in the eye, and starts having a conversation with you, then you'll be like, huh, I'm having a social interaction with a 12-year-old. This is blowing my mind. This is, this is the feedback we get all of the time. 
and like princey i've just spent 45 minutes having dinner and talking to your kids this is freaking amazing like how <laughs> like yeah but think about how weird that is that you just said like how far have we fallen that you Incredible. find it strange that you're able to sit there and have and hold an intellectual discussion with a 12 year old and give them the time and see the reaction and have them feed back to you like why have we lost that well we've lost that because it's beaten out of us insidiously and purposefully in the education system and uh john taylor gatto does a much better uh job of um conveying that message if anybody wants wants to read his book so like i said yeah hold on to your kids by dr gabo Marte. if you have any inkling at all that your, your child is just not 100 percent happy when they're coming home from school locking themselves in their room like moody at dinner time you know all this kind of stuff that we went through this isn't normal we've normalized it this isn't good yeah, read one that- of those books it is. It's so scary. It's so sad, you know, and it's, well, it's like, well, you know, my parents did it and and then their parents did it. So you're mm-hmm. like, you said, they just normalize this. And it's like, you almost, you're in this, this open air prison that you don't even realize you're in. Cause it's just like, well, that's what everyone else did. So I guess this is the way life just is supposed to be. Uh, it, it's really just numbing, you know, this is really, you know, the, like you said, the the brainwashing and the indoctrination uh, of of the system, the government run schools, uh, as I always like to say, they're not public schools or government run schools. And, uh, you know, I, I would love you to touch on this. I don't know how familiar you are with this uh, in, in America, but to me, the the three kind of turning points, were, because really from what from what I can see. And I haven't done as as much homework in the in the homeschooling and the education system uh, as you have. However, from some of my studies, just seeing the really last hundred years is really when this formal system really kind of took shape. And I know there were mm-hmm. formal schools per se, maybe uh, two hundred years ago or beyond that. But for thousands of years, it was just you know boys around the farm working with dad. You know, like there was with them all day long and learning how to be a man for thousands of years. And just in the last hundred years, this industrial age, it was like, well, dad's got to go to the factory now, and now you just got to go over here to school and we got to make you do something while I'm gone. Um, and so it's really just this last hundred years or so. And I look at like the committee of 10 in the late 1800s here in America, and then the general board of education, the Rockefeller in the early 1900s. And then the other thing was the, I think the three of the, the third of the three big things was the Frankfurt school coming over to America in the thirties and, and really starting to change things and kind of led to the sixties, the, the, the flower power movement in the sixties here in America. So those three things to me have really changed along with the industrial stuff, but um, I would love for you to kind of even touch on that. So le- leading into, um, or uh, I guess emanating from the brainwashing and, and indoctrination and kind of how those things have worked together and what you see and what your studies over the years have looked like uh, and, and how they kind of use this mechanism to, like you said, socialize you and kind of just lead you into this pasture as, as a bunch of sheep. So I would love your thoughts on on any of that. Yeah, absolutely. And Gatto, again, is the man for this. And you can read his, his book, uh, The Underground History of the American Education System. And he points to Horace Mann, and I think it was uh, 18, mid 1800s to late 1800s that Horace Mann went across to uh, Germany and uh, Prussia, actually, to, oh, okay. um, to study the Prussian schooling system. And, and that is basically what was taken back in his findings was we have to impose the, uh, the, 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 the Prussian schooling method, which was basically to train military uh, and... Um, obedient soldiers or workers uh, that's what we need to implement in in the u.s because the u.s uh, to that point right there was just taking off in all kinds of free market directions um very uh strong pockets of kind of for want of a better word libertarian or free market dynamics which is no good if you are uh, um, a keen monopolist, and you've already named the the keenest of monopolists right there <laughs> in uh, in Rockefeller, so he was busy, you know, or had been busy, already had completely monopolized the the energy yeah. industry, and was looking out for uh, for other opportunities. And of course, well, well, if if you monopolize, if you can monopolize the education system, then you literally can write the agendas and the curriculums and keep people to a certain level of education, like this glass ceiling. Like you will, we will give you all of this kind of stuff. And this is John Taylor Gatto's uh, seven lessons. 
is an amazing either chapter or article. You can just find John Taylor Gatto, Seven Lessons, and even a YouTube video. And he talks about the seven lessons of schooling, which he did because he was a state school teacher for 30 years. And he, this is like what you're taught as a teacher, the seven lessons. And lesson number one is confusion. Confusion is the first weapon when kids enter into the school, like complete confusion. Okay, what are you here to do? What are you here to learn? And you're here to learn from this point, uh, you know, for, for these hours, these subjects. So come the end of the first week, imagine 11 year old, take yourself back. You're 11 years old. You've just graduated in air quotes to uh, this other school. So you're not even with your original bunch of comrades, right? They've been ripped away from you. But that's confusing in itself. Like you, you went through the first psychological trauma of being left at a school gate at the age of three, four or five and watching your mother walk away in one direction whilst you were shuttled into a classroom with 29 other strangers. You've got through that part of your life. And now it's being re-engineered. All of those comrades that you'd made in that original gulag, uh, you've got to you know, redesign that. You're like, oh, right, okay, here's a whole new thing. Confusion, how do they do confusion? Well, you've got 45 minutes of math, then you've got an hour and a half of French, then you've got uh, a quick break, 15 minutes, but you're not allowed to run, jump or play and no balls in the playground. And then, you know, it's back in here and you've got to be here for a history lesson and then it's lunch, but lunch is split into two and you can't go into that room and you can't go in that room. And then in the afternoon, you've got PE and you're going to be playing lacrosse, even though you, you've never played it before and you don't care. <laughs> and then, so you get to the end of that week holy shit, like, you know, you, you're done, right? At that point, you're done. It's like, right, anything to get through the next six years of this shit. It's complete madness. Oh, true. So that is how you just completely destroy people's self, individual skills and interests and creativity, like back to Sir Ken Robinson, do schools kill creativity? Yes, they do. They absolutely destroy it. And for a reason, because this is how it was all set up. When Rockefeller and Chums, mm -hmm. and you can name them all, Gatto, name, Gatto names them all, who, who funded the education system? Rockefeller, Morgan, Ford, Carnegie. They've, they've still yeah. got schools named after them or centers or libraries. You know, they're mm -hmm. hiding yeah. in plain sight. Yes. And this is... What <laughs> and that is also how they can lobby the governments and set up everything else that they need to set up. And what else did they want to monopolize? Well, if you've monopolized energy and you've monopolized education, you may as well go the whole hog, monopolize health yep. with the pharmaceutical I'm industry. Food and, yep, and of yep. course, well, let's go for the money. How do I monopolize the money? Well, you put people in Jekyll Island in 1910 who come up with this great big think tank plan of the federal reserve and then they forced the federal reserve act christmas week of 1913 when half of congress are on holiday and now all of the pieces start falling into place you're like oh oh shit and you don't want to be a part of that so how do you get away from that so you get away from the money with bitcoin you just opt out of the using their money you're not using the medium of exchange that they've forced you to use. You opt out of their schooling system. How do you do that? Well, homeschooling, world schooling, whatever. You don't yeah. have to leave your country unless some, some European countries you do have to leave because they're so strict. It's illegal. Like in Germany, it's illegal. Holland, it's illegal. Sweden, it's illegal. Yeah. Illegal, to home, illegal to teach your own children. This is how far gone <laughs> some of these nation states are. And like... Wow. Uh, how do you opt out of the health system? Well, you start learning about um, homeopathy and natural medicines and you start going down those rabbit holes and start meeting those amazing people and they all get drawn to Bitcoin. This is what's beautiful, right? You meet all of these people at these yes. conferences and they blow your mind. You're like, what do you mean? Like, this yeah. is amazing. They were like putting puzzle pieces together you were that. missing. Yeah, yep. yep. Exactly. So um, yeah, and like, you know, to, to really put a nail in this, look at the timeline of the human, of our species, of the Homo sapien. Like, you know, it's it's this long. Let's say it's a meter long yardstick. That's the timeline we're looking at. Mm -hmm. huh. Public education, public again in air quotes, that is a 
tiny dot on that one meter yes. long ruler. Like it's not even a millimeter. It's yeah. a nanometer. It's a micrometer. It's it's yeah. just a, the, the tiniest speck. It, so what the fuck are we doing? Like, yeah. this doesn't yeah. work. We've seen the damage it does. And let's go back to how it was when your kids grew up around you or the extended family and learned from you the, the, the so-called soft skills, the, the way to act around people, can interact with different ages, can interact with uh, different cultures and can cook for themselves and can you know, make clothes and do all of this kind of stuff, which of course, no, that's not important. You know what's important? Calculus and trigonometry. That's what's important. <laughs> oh man. How I know it's a, it's five, two right now. How much time do you have, Princey? Oh, we can go, man. We can go. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so I would love to like the, 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 the inevitable question I, I get, and I'm sure you get to right. Which is, you know, well, like, how do you, like, how do you see that? Like how, how, what led you down that rabbit hole or like, cause I always, I'm, I don't even know how to quantify, like, why am I always questioning things? Like what it's like the trust, but mm -hmm. verify why I'm like always questioning and asking why, you know, and you have like, you know, the, the normie, the, you know, the NPCs just walking around and you're always going to have those people, right? You know, the poor will always be among you. You're always going to have people like that. But for the people that the, the 5%, 10%, 20% of people that are out there, which is all we need to really wake up. How how is it like? What do you think are some of the most important either skills like critical thinking, or how can you sharpen some of those things, or what are what are some of those things you see in yourself, maybe or or in other people that you're like, man, if people could just do this, or if people could just do that, and kind of see what we're all seeing here at, at this conference or or whatever is happening to get people there to kind of wake them up. In in your opinion, in your mind, what are those thoughts that have kind of come across your head of like, man, if we could just do this, or if we could just get people to see this way or think this way, uh, what is it that to you? Uh, that's a great question. And I think it's, <laughs> um, I don't think there's anything we can do to, to force it. Uh, I, I think all you can do is let your actions speak louder than your words, uh, because people come up to me all the time that they, you know, even Bitcoin is, uh, it's like, whoa, seeing you here with your kids, seeing you at the last one with your kids, seeing you last year with your kids, <laughs> how do you do it? Like, this is, this is amazing. Right, right. Fuck it. I'm bringing my kids to the next one. Um, yes. Podcasts are great, but you can't you you can't wake somebody up that's not ready to be woken up. Right. That that is so deeply personal, and you have no idea uh, the battles that that person has had in the past or is uh, is currently waging within themselves. Um, COVID, I think, is going to be going to go down in history as the biggest turning point of red pilling orange pilling people um into into consciousness and it is that's the beauty of it like they you know uh pandemic scandemic you know call it mm -hmm. whatever you want this was <clears throat> this was truly a kick in the balls for so many people me me included i never thought they would ever go like that far Same. really i really had no clue i mean it was already down the rabbit hole at that point yeah but then that completely Same. supercharged me to even deeper depths of the rabbit hole and <laughs> like what really is going on here and uh i've seen it wake up other people as well um yeah, to, to that I point, Princey. Well, to okay, so to that point, you, I'm one with you 100. Like to me, I was 10, 12 years in. I, I'm graduating college. I see 08, 09 happen. I'm like, wow, Uniparty was unveiled to me. I was very political before that, and I'm like, whoa, 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 these two, these people are on the same team. Like we're all getting played, and that's what led me into Creature from Jekyll Island and Kiyosaki and Mike Maloney reading about gold and silver and sound money. So that was 2010, you know, nine, 10, 11, and. I thought I was very well versed. I knew the political side for 10 years before that. And then I was learning the money side. So the last 10, 12 years, I, I understood the money and you have to understand, understand politics and money to get the whole picture. You can't just do one or the other really. So I thought I, I thought I knew I was like, Oh wow, I, I got it. And then 2020 happened and I was blindsided. I was like, wow, I never yeah. thought that. And, and like many of us, people that were down the rabbit hole, way down the rabbit hole. And, and many of us blindsided. I think that was a huge wake up call to me. And, and, and what was, you know, really, uh, you know, what they're, they're capable of, I guess. So it's, 
you know, to me, it's like, okay, how do you wake that up? And, and my, my big uh, question, I guess, at the end of this is how do you wake people up? However, I think, is it, is it kicks in the ass? You know, like, is it truly going to be kicks in the ass that get people to, you know, kind of that human nature of like, well, I don't change until I get kicked in the ass or kicked in the face or I'm in a street fight. It, it feels like that, you know, what, I mean, what do you think? Like, it feels we're going that way. People just have to keep being punched in the face until they finally wake up. It does feel that way way ah um, scary and so, you so if the, those punches in the face here's here's the good news those punches in the face are going to keep coming yes uh, because you know we've got the yes, cbdc's are. that are uh, coming there's going to be i mean we're in the everything bubble so the everything bubble is going to burst and that nobody's safe vaccine and, passports uh, coming out coming soon you know oh right God. yeah yeah so like it's so those punches in the face are going to keep coming it's um yeah, for, for people that are listening to this that uh you know that they feel that they're awake and they've seen through the BS and you know they're stacking their sats, just keep let keep letting your actions do the work. Be be the leader, but not not in the the traditional sense of the word, you know. Just, just mm-hmm. lead by example, I suppose, is probably the best thing to be doing. And um keeping calm not screaming and shouting with everybody else, just letting your actions, you know, speak for themselves. If you've got your kids out of school and they're homeschooling, keep doing that, then exposing your kids to um, the people around you because they will keep sitting They will keep noticing. It's like, why are your kids happier than mine? Why are your kids more polite than mine? Why are your kids calmer than mine? Like, you know, all of these things, they slowly add up and to a point where something is going to, click for them or crack for them or break for them and then they're there they're 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 coming to you for questions and they're interested in the answers and they will listen Um, and yeah it's there's no magic wand to wave i'm afraid um it's just uh I was, I was scared you're going to say that. Yeah. (laughs) What do you, I mean, I think the one thing that I've learned over the last few years is watching you know like almost closing your ears like plugging your ears and just watching what people do you know not what they say and i think that's because again i know i'm sure a lot of us have had people that said like hey how did you see that coming or like how did you kind of see through the bs over the last few years or whatever and again it's not like it's not because we're genius i think i think a lot of the geniuses you could argue are the ones that got it wrong you know like the high iq people are tend to be the ones who got it wrong around the wrong side so it, to me it was just like i don't know, i just watch what people are doing you know like you have governor of california literally uh, what seven days after they lock everyone down he's he's at the restaurant they locked down with all of his medical friends with no mask on party by themselves in an empty yeah. restaurant and it's like that first week in march of 2020 you should know right there oh this is a scam you know like little things like that instead of listening to what the media is saying or to what uh, all these pontificators are saying it's like watch what people are doing you know close your ears mm-hmm. you know and just watch and um i think that's one of those those big things that you you something you said i forget what it was but it just made me think of that and it just kind of jogged my memory um what so kind of moving a little bit but kind of the same vein what are some of your kids aha moments over the last few years like some of the you know the you have your children what have or some maybe profound things or aha moments they've had or they've said to you over the last few years and it could be anything could be bitcoin could be the you know lockdowns it could be government stuff you know whatever is there there anything you can think of just off the top of your head i know i'm putting you on the spot with this one but anything the kids have said to you that you're kind of like wow um you know just like i didn't think a kid could even understand that or you know anything (laughs) like that at all (laughs) Yeah, not. I, it's when I hear them talk to other people that blows me away. Mm. It's when I hear them uh, having a discussion. Uh, my oldest daughter was sitting next to Eric Case at a dinner in Miami, and they were having this discussion about Nietzsche and uh, anarchism, <laughs> uh, anarchism. And uh, I'm like, what? Jeez. All right, okay, this is this is crazy. This is wild. And um, Lauren having a discussion with that. They were being interviewed. All the kids were being interviewed for uh, Natalie's show, Natalie Brunel's show. Oh yeah. Yeah. And um, Hunter was asking them questions and they were all chiming in with their answers. And man, this is, this is amazing. Like they've been listening somehow it's been going in and whether it's me talking about it at the dinner table Mm -hmm. or people at the conferences or sitting through some of the, uh, the, the panels, um, if they've been to a conference and I'm on a panel, they'll come and listen to that panel. Caitlin and Lauren working with Saifedine was huge. Uh, Caitlin is now reading, she's read the Fiat Standard. She's reading Principles Now of Economics. 
Um, she just picked up the little hodler the other day because Lena, Lena signed them a copy and uh, oh, okay. she was just sitting there giggling Love away that. at it. And mm -hmm. she's like, oh, right. Yeah, okay. I get this. And that is, um, that's gold when, when you see that happen. Or if someone asks them, what's Bitcoin? And they don't just turn around and say, well, it's kind of like a money for the internet, uh, but there'll only ever be 21 million. Uh, therefore, it's scarce. And basically, people are going to value it and in the future, we'll all be using Bitcoin. Very basic understanding, but they hit the right points and they know what they're saying and they know how to deliver it. Yeah, that, that, and my son on the way back from Prague, he was sitting next to, we got split up. We weren't sitting next to each other and he was sitting next to two French ladies and he started talking to them in French. Then they switched to English because they spoke very, very good English. Um, they were teachers in the uh, international school in Germany. And uh, yeah, I just listened to him start trying to orange pill these two ladies who were teachers in an international school. I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> that's, he's that's trying amazing. to orange pill these ladies. Yeah, my dad's, uh, he's got a podcast. It's called Once Bitten. You should learn about it. Bitcoin's going to be the money of the future. He was on a high from Prague conference himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that was, and Lauren was turning around on her knees. She's, yeah, yeah. And I was doing a panel and these women, they were like just blown away. Like, oh my gosh yeah okay yeah we do need to start thinking about it yeah because we've heard about it okay now you've said we're going to go home we'll buy a book or we'll read an article or we'll listen to your dad's podcast uh, this is so heartwarming to um to see uh, and seeing sam and his friend samuel and his friend sam with the um they were selling little uh badges uh which they were had been 3d printed um and they had an NFC sticker on the back and they were programming. Mm. So people would buy them and it might say Nostra or Zap Me or something like yeah. that. And yep. then they would uh, take the guy's phone, download NFC tools, get the thing loaded up. There you go. Now anybody walking around this conference can just tap your badge and it'll take you straight to their, your Nostra profile and they can follow you. And they picked that up in an instant. And I was, this is incredible. Uh, this is learning. And they were doing that for three straight days. Wow. Uh, and yeah, yeah. it's, amazing it's incredible and it, it's it goes back to kind of what we were saying earlier but where like how far we've fallen you, you know kids can learn it, it depends on who you speak to as well i mean there's a lot of people that believe you know like when kids are those first five years i mean they're geniuses like literal geniuses and depending on who you talk to and and, and what they can do obviously they can learn any language 10 languages it just it doesn't matter um so they have all these capabilities that we don't even have in a way as an adult uh, and it, or it takes us a lot longer to do what they're doing. Right. So, um, in, in saying that, what do you think, or like, what do you teach the kids or how have you taught the kids over the years about money? Uh, and mm -hmm. it doesn't even have to be Bitcoin necessarily, but just like value, uh, transacting, um, was it, were you guys creating businesses together? Were you guys selling books? You know, like what, what were you guys doing? how did you kind of form them in, in understanding money and value? Because again, the whole thing, you know, I'm sure it was a pub, a, a government run school system uh, thing that came from that, which was got to give them uh you know, chores to do. And they get uh, their, their little, you know, allotment each, each week. Um, and you know, whatever it's that kind of this paycheck mentality. Right. But how mm -hmm. did you do that with the kids growing up and, and show them, you know, value and, and what time and energy means? Yeah. Um, I remember when, Caitlin uh, and Sophia were eight and six. We were in Thailand at the time. And um, on the compound, there's about 20 houses. And the girls set up a little pancake delivery business. And we, we went through the whole thing. Like, how much is the ingredients? Let's go out and shop for the ingredients. You know, we got the spreadsheet up. So I had them both on a computer inputting all of this. Okay, if that's out, the cost of our raw ingredients, how much is it, you know, how much can we uh, sell them for? realistically how are we going to get the the message out there well let's print off a little menu and let's go around knock on all the doors and pass it to the people and introduce ourselves so that was uh, one of uh, their earliest memories of 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 money of trying to earn money of trying to add value of looking for a niche in the market there was nobody within that compound delivering food and uh, it would have been cool right just to be able to uh, support uh, a couple of little girls that are making pancakes and um you know it's just a classic lemonade stand story right yeah so, uh we we did that and then uh obviously my wife and i um were always uh again it's leading by example because they were around us the whole time and we were traveling and now i'm not earning 
we were very careful with where and how we were spending our money. And because you can't turn learning off, the kids would be learning from us all of the time. All of our decisions were out in the open. Right, okay, what are we going to do today? Well, we're here in this t- in this country, in this city. We're probably never going to come back to this part of the world again. And the main tourist thing to do is that. How much does that cost? Do we find enough value in that? Is that worth it? Or hang on, can we find a, like other discounted tickets? Are there promo codes? Is there a certain day or a certain afternoon that you can go? So yeah, lo and behold, New York, we found that between... X hours on a Tuesday or the first Tuesday of every month, you could get into the um, uh, the 9-11 museum for free, mm-hmm. like anyone. And like so few, so few people know that, but they would, they would see us consciously making these decisions all of the time about how to save our money or deploy our money in the most effective way possible. Uh, so they definitely understand that you, you know, money is uh, to be valued, stored, and saved, but deployed when uh, the you know that the balance weighs in your favor. Like the experience that you're going to get out of spending that money is going to outweigh your your hoarding of it and your saving of it. And coming uh, and coming from that will be some kind of um, uh, learning experience that's that's what they grew up around certainly for the the two and a half years that we were constantly on the road with them it's so cool and it's the thing that's obviously uh littered throughout what you just said is you're talking to them about it right they're hearing you you made Mm -hmm. it available to them it's out in the open and that's something you hear all the time from people of the last couple of generations which was the parents didn't talk to them about money obviously there's a lot of relationships and because of money problems no one is never talked about even with your spouse or your significant other it's not talked about the kids so no you know no one knows what's going on i think that's that the the key that i took away from what you just said was they're involved in that they're hearing it they're Mm -hmm. seeing it it's it's just a it's just a part of life it's not like it doesn't not a good or bad it's just it's a part of life and we're all going to learn this together which is brilliant and yeah those those conversations at at the dinner table as well are so key you know that how uh and a lot of people that are stuck in the system don't even have those because mum or dad are out until work until late or um, yes. the kids kids get home they've got after school activities and you end up eating alone or you know um, split apart and you can't sit down and have that hour long dinner and these discussions and talking about um, <laughs> one one fun thing I like to do because it elicits such a strong triggered reaction at the dinner table is we'll be talking about something. And uh, there'll be opposing views or there'll be a problem and this, that and everything. And I'll just turn around and a classic example I can think of. Uh, my my daughter was telling us about how one of her friend's parents had uh, just divorced and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And now that's pretty much all of her friend's parents have divorced uh, since she's known them in the last five years. It's so sad. You know, why does this keep happening? I don't understand it. Please, you know, you know, you, mom and dad, you, you never break up you know i'm like well we won't uh i can't promise you but i doubt we will and by the way bitcoin fixes divorce and then she gets triggered like bitcoin doesn't fix everything I'm like, yes it does <laughs> and let's have the discussion about how or why i believe that it would fix divorce well how can bitcoin yeah. fix divorce and then we get into the fiat incentives and fiat relationships and it's like we'll look at what the relationship was built on in the first place that it was probably built on fiat um relationships uh, oh no they've known each other from school i'm like there you go like that, that's what was right back to the beginning of the conversation about socialization right a camaraderie was formed that was uh, that relationship was built on a fiat foundation within an indoctrination camp and you know the layer on top of that both parents are working layer on top of that, both are on the hamster wheel layer on top of that. They can't meet their bills and layer on top of that, all of the stresses and worry of bringing up a kid and the uncertainty yes. of the future. And now all of a sudden they can't figure out why they're not happy together. And bam, they have an argument over money and whose fault it is that, you know, they have to be both working seven days a week and then they can't make ends meet and they split up. And that's that. Whereas if you had a, 
saved your time and energy in something that cannot be inflated away from you, manipulated or stolen through inflation and taxes and whatever other mechanisms they pull, changing exchange rates, changing interest rates, changing mortgage rates on you willy-nilly. No, if you had just helped Bitcoin, you would have a much safer view and further view into the future and you can plan accordingly and you're much calmer. Uh, so I, I truly believe that going forward, divorce rates over the next 100 years are going to plummet because the relationships in which we're going okay. to enter will be way more uh, thought through and built on solid, pure solid foundations. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I'll, I'll take that another step further and, and the birth rates will, will go back up as well. Yes. Birth rates will go up, right? And relationships will, yeah, you'll have less divorce, everything. So I agree with you a hundred percent. So they're the kind of brilliant. conversations we have at the dinner table. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's, and it's so brilliant too. And it's, it's that you put that so well, cause that, that's what, um, you know, Bitcoiners in general and, it, and on Twitter, you know, how are you going to explain all that? But you put, you lay that out beautifully of the fiat incentives and, and how fiat really does destroy all these things and how Bitcoin fixes all this. I mean, Bitcoin is this all, Bitcoin fixes this, is this all encompassing slogan, tagline, you know, phrase that, you know, Bitcoiners, you see in every walk of life is just hard to explain in a, in a tweet or even to your friends and family or hanging out. It's just, it, it is hard to explain, but you said that so well, and it, it is, it can be quick. You, you explain it in 30 seconds you know and just kind of the, mm -hmm. the knock-on effects of of doing that and at the end of the day it's the kids i mean doing that with the kids it, it, that's why i'm so passionate about the kids space as well and i think i was telling you working with uh, bitcoin trading cards the things we're doing there i'm writing some kids books stuff like that because you control the youth you control the future and that's where it is hard to talk to an adult and, and then kind of go back into this and i think it was the book aftershock elvin toffler that talked about the people that will be successful in the future will have to uh learn unlearn and then relearn and it's hard for an adult I and mean, we just talked about that a minute ago but it's, it's tough what what do you think and we talked about the covid and lockdowns a couple of years ago what do you think is, is one of those big like experiences or aha moments maybe earlier in your life that kind of led you were you always kind of this way of questioning things or were you was there something that happened earlier in life that you're like oh like something's something's happening here and i've got to go a different yeah. direction was there anything like that or just kind of naturally that way i love those those moments that happened way before the discovery of bitcoin that <laughs> primed you to understand bitcoin right and mm -hmm. for uh and for me i remember uh i would have been 27 28 uh living in singapore have been there six years or so uh, my wife and I were flying, my wife-to-be and I were flying back to the UK to have like a little marriage ceremony with all our friends and family. Um, we booked up the venue and we got the florist and the cake and the photographer and all of that stuff sorted out. And then we had bills to pay, right? So I was going to, I walked into my high street bank, uh, a bank that I had uh, opened an account at at the age of 12, whatever it was. Where all my savings have been up until that point, you know, mm -hmm. save up little Danny, like uh, one day you're going to need, uh, you know, 10 grand for a wedding and just put aside whatever you can every week. And I did that diligently. I saved, I listened to my, uh, the advice of my elders, my mother and my father. And uh, that was the, that was the money I was going for. So I walk in there uh, and I ask, I'd like to withdraw my, you know, 10,000 pounds from my account, please. Uh, because I wanted to pay these guys in cash, uh, and uh, then, well, sir, you 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 can't, you can't, you can't. It was like classic if, for for the British people watching. It was a classic computer says no pe uh, um, <laughs> experience. Uh, there's there's a British program called uh, Little Britain, where one of the the skits was uh, you walk in and the computer says no, like the total NPC. So I'm dealing with this NPC. <laughs> And I look at her and she was a young girl. She was younger than me. I'm like, why? Because uh, you don't have the correct uh, identity. I'm like, I've just given you a passport. She said, well, yeah, but we need more than that. You need more than my bank book, more than my bank card, and more than my passport. Oh, I'll have to check with head office. So she calls head office in front of me, twiddling her hair. And I can hear the guy on the other end. There, this is before the days of big glass partitions, you know, Jeez. before, you know, we were fully in the war of terror. Uh, so I could hear, you know, it, coming through the earpiece, 
explain to me what the passport looks like well, it's a it's a it's purple in color i'm like it's a british fucking passport like what are you guys oh, doing boy. in front of me right now Jeez. and then he's like well open tell me what the pages look like well there's a lot of squiggly lines and there's pictures of birds in the middle <laughs> and does he look like his picture on the back well yeah okay um yeah no we can't verify this and then she puts the phone down and says no oh, head, head of us said you can't I like you have to be kidding me. I got this money saved from the age of 12, which I need right now. It just so happened my dad was walking past the front of the bank, and my my girlfriend, wife to be, fiance, ran out and said, We're having trouble with the uh so he comes in, knows the branch manager because guess what? Lived in the town for 25 years until that point. Yes, it's all in a room together. We have to sign off all of this documentation before I can take my own money out. Now, I didn't realize that, that moment was priming me to understand Bitcoin mm -hmm. and ownership and property rights and you know, like access to my money when I want it. Just nuts. So that is when I look back on that now, with that, it's just hilarious to me that we ever got to a point of allowing that to ever happen but we slept we were sleepwalking into it the whole time it, and that's it, what's going to happen with the cbdc's next we're going to sleepwalk into that 100 this is uh kiyosaki's book capitalist manifesto that came out uh like a year or two ago is mm. is phenomenal because it's, it's really all about communism and, uh, you know, it's about capitalism, but it's a largely a lot of it about capitalism. And there's a thousand quotes in there from Lenin and Stalin. And it is mind blowing when you go through that and you you know a lot of it, you know, just, and then when you put it all together, you're just like, oh, boy. And you he talks about brain slaves in there. And all I can think of is is that right. We've been talking about schooling and all this, just creating brain slaves mm -hmm. and the warlords. And, and really, in the beginning, they didn't want people taking over or questioning them. So they just kind of kept people down their education level, like you talked about with schooling. And they just kind of kept yeah. them at a certain level because they weren't the most educated people, though the warlords. And and that's how this system kind of perpetuated. And you you have this this system now where you now are just put in this this silo and you, the people just think about life through their job instead of like, I'm a human, I live on earth and I just happen to work and you know, it is what it is. Now it's like, everything is my job. You know, like, well, I can't get fired. I can't, this can't happen. That can't happen. No, I got to mm -hmm. put something in my body because they told me to, because I can't lose a paycheck, you know, next week because mm -hmm. they don't know how to function in the fiat incentives and this whole thing cascades down. And that's, I just keep coming back to that over and over again. It makes me think of, um, the lady the other day we went viral on Bitcoin Twitter. People are passing around the uh, I think she runs. She was in North Carolina at the time. And now she runs the CDC, I think. And she was like, you know, well, you're not going to. I called up to Massachusetts. And I was like, you're not going to give them pro, for a pro football. Right. And they're like, um, no. And she's like, OK, I won't either. And then she's like, ah, ah, ah. you know, a lot of conversations like that. And it's exact conversation you just talked about with the bank teller being like, well, what's the color? You know, like, <laughs> how is it printed? What paper is it on? You know, like, oh, no, I don't think that's it. Oh, sorry. You know, it's like just completely arbitrary, completely just, you know, clown world. And the fact that people can't see it is like we talked about earlier, too. You talked about there's me more punches in the face, the CBDCs, the health, the health passports, all this stuff where people are going to keep being punched until they realize, oh, I'm in a fight. I'm actually in a fight right now. <laughs> I you, you and just, it's when people know. have nothing to lose, right? That's when they're going to wake up. Exactly. When it's exactly. Gone. Yes. Th that's what's going to happen with the CDCs. Uh, it, it, but then you're going to have a lot of angry people and a real lot of unrest. And we don't want that in the world. We. Uh, what did I tweet the other day? Government equals warmongering Nobel peace winners. <laughs> and Bitcoin equals... <laughs> Peace loving. I, I did see that. Right. Oh man, you uh, you always have fire tweets. Everyone's got to follow <laughs> Daniel on Twitter. We can we'll talk about that in a minute. Where to follow you? But you, your tweets are just always amazing. Oh boy, I. What do you think? I mean, we talked about this already a little bit, but I mean, just as a as a society, what do you think we're missing in general? Like, I, one of the things I think, and I think a lot of it has to do with men. You know, men, whether it's the fiat foods and decreasing uh, testosterone levels, all these things that are that are planned and orchestrated to decrease testosterone, which 
that's scientifically proven the more testosterone someone has, the more likely they are to say you're someone's wrong and, and argue mm -hmm. with someone basically and say, no, 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 that's not right. And they've decreased that overall as a society so much that you just have all these NPCs walking, you know, so many of us just walking around like we've been talking about. I mean, what in your mind, and this is such a hard question, a loaded question, but maybe this thing that pops in your head as a society, what are we missing the most? Is it our, our, our health is so bad? Is it the way we think? Is it the schooling? Like to you, if I'm, you know, someone on the streets like, Hey, what do you think is wrong with society? What is your thing that you always kind of come back to? You're like, man, if we just changed this, if we just did this, we would be 90% better. Fix the money, fix the world. <laughs> there we go. You know, <laughs> uh, I put but, in the D, I guess. Yeah. To, to your point, I, I have been down that rabbit hole of, uh, have you read that book, Estro Generation, by no. Anthony J? I've got a podcast worry, with no. him. If uh, I, I don't know the number of okay. the podcast off my head, but it's Dr. Anthony J, uh, Estro Generation. And he talks about the de engineering of the population, basically, through the, uh, the food and through the water. And people would like to put their tinfoil hats on and, you know, call you a conspiracy theorist and whatever else. But, you know, we, we've talked about who and how people have monopolized certain industries and for one of well, for, for most of the world, to be quite frank. Um, and then uh, I, I found myself falling down the, uh, the niacin rabbit hole and learning about uh, flush niacin. Through uh, through a Bitcoiner who put me on to uh, Dr. Dimitri Katz, who just blows the lid off of it all. And if people want to read um, a book about that, it's called Niacin, The Real Story uh, by Andrew Saul. Um, Did and you it share that? In. Did you share that recently or something like that? I feel like I just yeah. saw that book or something recently. Or maybe, it, yeah, I was going to say it probably was you. Yeah, and yep. I've done two pods now and a spaces uh, because I yep. find it fascinating. And... Uh, yeah, like you say, we've been, you know, down, evolved, basically. Uh, and I love the fact Bitcoiners are the ones that are picking up on this. And why are they the ones that are picking up on it? Well, because the, the time, time, if you can own your time, then you can start reading up on all of these other things that you for whatever it's reason, simple as that. find yeah. it interesting. Yep. If you do not own your time, if your time is somebody else's... Your brain slave. So, so, yeah, exactly. Yep. So how do you own your time? Yep. Well, you have to free yourself from the manipulation of that of that money. And, you know, it's just as simple. It's just as simple as buying some Bitcoin. It's as simple as opting out of one medium of exchange and opting into another. Uh, but please, for those that are listening to this, in the early days of your own rabbit hole journey, do that slowly. Don't hone in. Don't like spend your life savings. Don't go selling everything and buying as much Bitcoin as you can. Please do your own research. Set yourself up a dollar cost average program and um, do it slowly and keep listening to the pods and keep reading the articles and the books and the YouTube channels. Uh, and you'll get there. We're still so early. Um, it's not a get quick rich scheme. It's an earn your freedom um slowly scheme i suppose <laughs> or what's the word slowly is not the word i'm looking for deliberately Deli yeah yeah earn your freedom yeah. deliberately and take charge of your own life and get in charge of your own time and then that's how we we all evolve in a, in a, in a better and more peaceful society yeah that's well said well said um Boy, oh boy. I know we've been rolling here for a, a little bit. Um, man, I just thank you so much. This is just so fast. This is what I love. Um, yeah, I I think this is so, um, again, biased, I guess, just because that's my narrative and thinking that kids and education, this is how you know really all this starts and emanates from. And you, I'm just obsessed with band-aids on bullet holes. Like society, just we're constantly like six-pack abs. We're going to throw some, you know, big farmers going to throw some pills and make us better all of a sudden. It's like, man, if you just fix the money, like you said, or if you just did a couple of these one couple of big core things, downriver, everything else takes care of itself. All the things people are fighting about and getting sick about. It's like, this is all, this, it's just completely moot. Like, why are you even worrying about the hundredth order effect when you just fix mm -hmm. the money or you just, you know, it, it just blows me away that we just, we seem to not get that. Or or people don't think like, huh, why is this being caused by, oh, it was by, caused by this. And what was causing that? No one works their way back up the river to think like, what started this? You know, like, 
they're just like trying to scoop oil out of like the, the you know, instead of like, you know what, maybe she just go stop the oil leak up at the top of the river and it's flowing down. They're like out there at the bottom of the river trying to pan it all out of the river. It's just like, I, I don't know why that is. I, I don't, I don't get it. Um, it, we've talked on Bitcoin numer numerous times, obviously, and that, cause it, it's just, I think the thread that goes throughout all this, obviously what, you know, bring it back to, I guess, squarely Bitcoin. What do you think the, the biggest thing for someone getting in, uh, someone who is a, a pre-coiner or no coiner getting in, like, how do you talk to somebody when they're, I guess when they're coming to you even saying, Hey, like, you know, I heard you talk about this or whatever it is, family or friends, what, how do you kind of, and I know like every person's different, they're going to come from their different way, but what are the things you kind of have found, uh, to help ease people in or start kind of talking about, Hey, this is where you buy something. I think the DCA, like you said, the savings technology is a way to talk about it a hundred percent. It's not a get rich quick scheme. So, it, you know, that, um, obviously it's huge. So what are you, what are your things that you kind of, uh, ease people into the system, I guess, um, and, and lead them to. Yeah. Difficult. And it's different for everybody. It is. Uh, and, um, I think the, the key thing to do is to listen, but that's the hardest thing to do because, yeah. because you're so full of the information yourself. If you've done the work, you you've listened yeah. to, it doesn't matter if you listen to 10 hours, a hundred hours, 300 hours, you're, you're up to speed and you've got something to say and you, you want to say it because you feel ethically and moral, morally obliged to share that information that you have. Uh, and that yes. comes out as well-meaning as you're trying to be, that comes out as like some crazy ass bat shit. Like, so you, you, you're, you're really banging your head up against the brick wall to begin with. So I wish I could have those earlier conversations back where I would just bite my tongue and listen, and this is what they teach you to do in sales. Mm -hmm. Just just open up the conversation and then be quiet. Because the person that you're talking to will give you hints as to where their pain points lie and where that's where you can start building. And it might be two or three conversations. You know, you might two or three meetings. It could be two or three yep. kids parties or whatever else. We bump into the same person that's still talking about the same pain point. And each time you just drop in a little, a little bit of the orange pill, just a little bit, just a little bit. And then those questions might start. And it could take you years, man. This is the thing. Um, for some people, it might just click. They might just be ready. Uh, that, that thing might have just happened in their life, like I explained to you with the, uh, the passport. Um, yeah. Or some people is going to take two or three. But if, if you can just be, be the touch point guy, that's so important. And today I gave out a touch point. We went to a restaurant for lunch. We really liked it. Local people, they're not using seed oils. Um, they're, they're cooking Himalayan food because the guy's French and she's from uh, just a, a country I'd never heard of, just outside of um, Nepal, Sikkim. And like the most incredible food, all fresh. They grow all the stuff themselves. And at the end of it, I was like, oh, do you accept Bitcoin? And he looked at me like, no, we accept money. So I just left it there. Like, you know, <laughs> that's it. But I was a touch point for him. Yes. That, that's the touch point. Next time I go back, I'll ask again. And he'll be like, oh, you again. And I've done that in other restaurants. And now they accept tips, at least, in Bitcoin. So, but that took me three or four visits. Um, it's, uh, it's a slow process. And take it slow. Don't unload on people immediately like we're all fucked and the money's <laughs> fucked and the freaking like oh don't you know anything about jekyll island and the federal reserve act like this is what they've been doing to us and they manipulate every freaking it's 50 percent of every freaking transaction like all of these things that we know yes. that you want to just like yell at like it's not gonna work man like just be the so touch true. point guy <laughs> so true there's uh it, you're right and that's you have to just keep yeah, incepting it right it's it, people have to come to it on their own and it's so there's a there's a, a story that I, I think it was jim Rohn, uh jim Rohn, you know one of my favorite personal development guys and just a classic and he would always talk about uh, this story where it was you know a parable i guess and it was the some preacher he was down in the some southern state or something like that and he was giving all these talks and and then one day he came to give a talk and no one showed up and he's like yeah the tent's empty like what's going on he's looking at his watch and then uh, one of the cowboys comes up like an hour later and it's just like one guy and he's like you know hey he's like 
I'm glad you showed up. If I've got a problem, like no one else showed up. He's like, well, you know, he's like, if I had one of my horses, I, you know, I don't know much about preaching, but I'm a cowboy. And I know if, if I came uh, to the pasture and only one of my horse showed up, I'd, I'd still feed him. And he's like, okay. You know, so he like gets up there and then he's like, does this thing. And he's just hitting it in an hour, hour and a half. He goes, and he's just preaching and preaching. And he gets, you know, afterward he comes down and he talks to the cowboy and he's like, you know, he's like, Hey, uh, you know, what do you think of the thing? He's like, well, he's like, I'm not a preacher. So I don't know much about that, but he's like, I'm I, being a cowboy. I know that if I only had one horse that showed up, I'd feed him, but I wouldn't dump the whole load on. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, there you it go. Me, yeah, exactly. That's just, us. Man, that, yeah, that's us. You hit, like you hit the yeah. nail on the head and it just made me think of that story. It's just, that is us. And um, so it's just an incepting, you know, cause it's, I truly believe that, not, you know, you're not going to have uh, and actually this is a question for you. Uh, cause we were just talking about this other day in one of the spaces. Like, what do you think, you know, we know the saying of, you know, you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes you. And there, mm -hmm. I think that is very true. It's changed us. I mean, I, I know, you know, firsthand, I thought, you know, I thought we got it. And then this is like, whoa, 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 we had a lot to learn getting into Bitcoin even. And so it will do that to a lot of people. But what do you think that kind of the spectrum of people will be, you know, say 10, 20, 50 years from now, what do you see as like, will a lot of society be changed because of Bitcoin or will there still be this kind of spectrum of like, yeah, one to 5%, 10% people of us kind of get it. And then everyone else is like, ah, I just use Bitcoin. I have no idea what's going on. I just use money. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? It's a little bit of pontificating, but I'd be interested to see what you say. Yeah. Well, I was talking to Pete Wynn this morning, who's over at Feddy and he was talking about you know, we got two to five years to onboard at least 4 billion people. If we don't do that, then this is not going to go the way any of us think it's going to go. Uh, and that was kind of a hard hitting realization is that, oh shit, yeah, he's kind of right. Are we ready for that? <laughs> um, and Fedi believe we're not. And that's why they're building the, the the protocols that they're building, which is really interesting to to look at it from, from that point of view, from that lens. Um, so let's say 2025, we got 4 billion people exposed to, or at least exposed to, or at least using Bitcoin on a daily, um, on a day-to-day -day basis. That can only be good for, you know, as we know, Bitcoin changes you. Um, that can only be good for peace and prosperity, uh, peace of mind. And that can only be good for giving people time even people savings how many people have savings like this this idea of savings is almost alien it's almost lost and how have they managed to do that in a in like a, in two generations because if you go back to i mean the boomers that they, they saved right that they, they, they knew yeah. savings because their parents above them they were savers so it's this last it's like from the gen x's down it this idea of cheap money and credit has been so freely available and forced on people that 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 dangled carrot that mortgage you know people think mortgages are amazing tools well yeah, yeah they can be or they can be you know a, a a lifelong prison sentence depends in depends what situation you are in at the moment when you take it uh and that just leaves people miserable for the rest of their lives so they, they don't have time they don't have ownership over anything you loan a, you loan nothing and be happy right that was the the wef thing yeah but i i look around myself well people already own nothing and they're pretty freaking angry from what i can tell you know they, they don't <laughs> own their houses they don't own their couches they don't own their cars they don't own their bikes they don't own anything and they're confused and angry and they can't figure out so how the wef think you're going to you know, turn that into happiness is a total nonsense. It's propaganda. But how do you how do you change that with Bitcoin? As we talked about, Bitcoin is savings technology. Bitcoin brings back uh, the idea of uh, low time preference, saving for the future, making better decisions, living a uh, more intentional lifestyle rather than one that's just running at a thousand miles an hour. Uh, it changes your health it changes what you eat it changes your buying habits we'd have much more of a free market dynamic rather than this subsidized market where nobody knows the true value of anything uh due to the manipulation and the, the subsidies and the lobbying that goes on hopefully governments became become smaller much smaller than they are now uh perhaps even 
obsolete at the at the yeah. very high level and they yeah. would get decentralized again um that's that's what i hope uh, uh i really do and um i hope that not a shot is fired not a um not another march is marched not a riot is rioted and let let's just um let's get back to i mean let's get back to the true definition of the word civilization you know what is a civilization it's civilized people who can you know uh, express value to each other with a medium of exchange that is truly sound and accounted for every 10 freaking minutes like, it's amazing it's just so simple so simple yeah wow well said do you um any is we'll start, we'll start wrapping up here do you have any uh you know last w- words of advice or anything like that i was gonna i wasn't gonna ask you i always try to ask people you know hey do you believe that freedom comes from the government or from the way people live but if people don't <laughs> know your answer at this point then I, right. <laughs> yeah. I, it's kind of a moot uh a moot point here i think we know uh just go re-watch uh, this episode again if you are confused about what yeah. daniel thinks um man just incredible incredible stuff it, at some point we'll have to deep dive into some of this stuff more even the homeschooling i mean just all this I, again i just i think this is the way it truly is the way fixing the food mm-hmm. you know, like you said fixing the money when it fixes the food it fixes the health if you know fix education and all the other downstream things take care of themselves you don't have to worry yep. about those things because they take care of themselves like you said boy oh boy um any well, last we, words yeah if we if we truly want to starve the beast then we have to stop feeding it willingly feeding it our yes. kids hearts well souls and minds we've got a rip we've got a rug pull them on our kids like we, we cannot just keep offering them up to the altar of state education we, we've got to stop because they they've overstepped the mark and they're really what's going on in the schools is, is truly disgusting and it's, it's sinful parent, i mean really it i really mean uh, it's, it's evil I mean, like you, we talked about the mental, you know, destroying people mentally the last hundred years. I mean, yep. and now it's physical. I mean, you're physically, mm-hmm. I mean, the mental side is actually physical as well, obviously, but the, the actually physically like, oh, we're going to help castrate you. Or, <laughs> I mean, it was just, mm-hmm. is this clown world, absolute clown world. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't, you can't even put it in so, the words. Yep. So you, you can't. And um, again, I know like, everybody is in a different situation. It's not a magic wand to wave, but there are things that you can put into place to take more agency yep. over your own life, over your kids' lives. Don't just march to the beat of the narrative. Don't believe the propaganda. Get out there, do your own research, find the people, have these conversations, get to a conference, get to a meetup, whether that's yes. a homeschooling meetup or a homeschooling conference, meet your people um, or Bitcoin and you know, it will all, it will all start clicking into place, but uh, yeah, I appreciate you having me on and yeah, what you're doing and thank you for, so fun. thank you for putting your voice behind the mic and, uh, and getting out there and, and doing it. We need more and more content, not less. Uh, yes, if people want to reach out, then I'm on Twitter at Prince C S O V store of value. That's what that stands for. Uh, my book is called choose life. You can find that it's my pinned tweet. That will take you to consensus yeah, I'll link network it here too. Yeah. And uh, if you use the code Bitten, you'll get ten percent off. If you pay via the Lightning Network, you'll get another ten percent off. So that's that's the deal. And you're supporting a Bitcoin business there, Consensus Network. Yep. Um, and that's it, really. Yeah, once Bitten is the podcast. If you're interested to go and listen to a few of those episodes, and uh, you'll you'll hear Lauren's voice on there as well. And I appreciate what you're doing, and thank you for for stepping up into the fold, man. Absolutely, brother. Um, you know, in large part because of you uh, and, and encouraging me over the last year or so. And uh, I, just, I appreciate that. And, and you're spot on. And I just I can't help but feeling that same thing as well of, man, if we just overwhelm the system with positivity and, and, and truth and doing this, if there was 10,000 of us doing this uh, and 10,000 times more people, you know, we win. We win. We overwhelm mm-hmm. the system. It's, it's psychological, right? I mean, the money is psychological engine, the economy everything's a psychological engine and that's all we need. It, it would overrun voting, right? Voting, everything turns because of the psychology of the people. You know, if tomorrow we woke up and said, we're not using that fiat currency done, you know, it's gone. And, and I yeah. think that's what people need to truly understand. 
Um, so man, well said. Any any other projects you are working on? I know, like I said, I'll link to the uh, the podcast, the book, and things like that. Any other projects you're working on to to aid? Uh, you know, it, oh, and that was the thing I was going to say too, which I think is a really important thing, and you've, you kind of mentioned this, which is, but I want to reiterate: support people. Not everyone can do it because you're you're so true or so correct in saying that not everyone can. Hey, I can't. We can't all pull our kids out of school right away, or not everyone can do that. But supporting people who are on that mission, or you know, buying their book, mm-hmm. listening to their podcast podcast, sharing it out, doing those little things to educate and help support the people that are. And then eventually a lot of us and a lot of people will get there to that point and, and be where, where you are, or, or some of us are. I think that's so huge and, and has to be talked about more supporting the people that are doing that already. That's huge. Any other projects you are working on besides, you know, the book and some of the, the other things you're, you're already put out. No, not at the moment. Although, uh, July, we're going to have a, a push for um, it being called Bitcoin Kids Month. Uh, so I'll have more kids on the podcast talking about that and uh, want to get as much education out as possible to younger people, whether they listen to it or not. I don't know, but adults enjoy it as well, uh, you know, hearing from the kids. So always happy to um, to push that. Uh, I've been helping out with um, a couple of Bitcoin companies uh Orange Pill app, one of those, I think that's a great app for people to download and find out where the events are and where other people are that they can connect with. And uh, Relay, who are a a, a brilliant app app to download and start buying Bitcoin from. Amity Age, which uh, are based out of Roatan in uh, Honduras, which are doing great work with education. You can find some good kids' education stuff from over there as well. Um, Yeah, that's that's the main thing. my podcast is highlighting all of that work and that's probably the best place to go. Beautiful. Daniel, thank you so much, brother. Uh, again, from the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate it and uh, look forward to doing this again here and diving into some more of the education and the kids. I, I think that's, that's the future. So I appreciate you, brother. I love it. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. See you. I, I told you that one was going to be a doozy over an hour of just straight fire He is, Daniel is one of the most intelligent people in the Bitcoin space, but also when it comes to, as you can see, kids formation and the the job that the the fiat currencies have done to destroy all of our minds and dumb down the populations really on purpose. Unfortunately, we have to say that the the evidence is in. It's clear after 100 plus years of, of evidence between the committee of 10 and uh, the General Board of Education and the Frankfurt School coming over and many other things that you saw Daniel mention, we have done ourselves and, and shot ourselves in the foot, quite honestly, and dumbed down the population to a point where we walk around like NPCs, non-playable characters, just heads in our phone, droids, little droids and robots that cannot think for themselves. Daniel is a true example of what it means to live your ethos, walk the talk, and build your family and raise your family in a way that is outside of the traditional norms and is is a true beacon for light and people that really do think for themselves and make their own decisions for their own reasons. Something not many people can say. So please go check him out. Please go check out his podcast. Please go check out his books, all the work he's doing for other companies. I, I really implore you to do it because he is so smart. I've learned so much from him. You're going to get so much out of him. Please go check him out. Go uh, reach out to him. I know he'd love that as well. He always loves educating. And we're going to deep dive more in the future into education and, and Bitcoin and, and how to raise a, a, a moral and integrity-driven, ethics-driven family and future. But I appreciate you coming to this interview, this podcast, this video with Daniel. Please go check him out. I look forward to seeing you on the next one.